I would say that um, from my analysis of internet dating sites, I can report on the move or the shift. There is a move from a retrospective imagination, which looks back on something that was, and which is a kind of synthesis of um, experience and highly structured cultural scenario, that's a retrospective imagination, to an anticipatory imagination of an object we have not met yet. Um, but um, so that's one. Um, so we have this shift, which I'm going to develop. And the second thing that I think characterizes the internet is that the imagination in the internet is imitative. In other words, it's not only about thinking. It's not only about this relationship that the subject has to himself. It is about trying to engineer and create and mimic the actual experience um, itself. This is very obvious in online games, for example, internet online games. But in internet dating sites also we have the same character of mimicking the actual experience while an object is absent. Um, according to a 2010 BBC World Service global poll which surveyed something like 11,000 internet users in 19 countries, 30% of all web users at any point in time are looking for a boyfriend or girlfriend. In some countries, like Pakistan or India, the, this number jumps to 60%. At any point in time in those countries, 60% are looking for a boyfriend or girlfriend. Um, and in one of their college love stories contests, the New York Times noticed a sweeping change. That's 2010. A sweeping change in modes of interaction from sexual um, casual hookups to relationships mediated by internet technology. Um, so the Sunday Styles, which is a supplement, a very highly read supplement of the New York Times, the Sunday Styles asked college students nationwide to tell stories in their own voices of what love is for them. And now I quote the New York Times. They say, when we first held this contest three years ago, the most popular essay topic was hooking up, the no strings attached sex that for many was not turning out to be so carefree. And the question that seemed to hoover over hundreds of such accounts was, how do we get the physical without the emotional? In only three years, the New York Times say, that problematic completely changed. Because then, when they got those same stories by college students, the most asked question that these stories revealed was, how do we get the emotional without the physical? So three years before, they wanted sex without the emotions. And now their question was, how do they get the emotion without the physical? The college hookup may be alive and well, but in these entries, the focus shifted to technology-enabled intimacy, relationships that grow and deepen almost exclusively via laptops, webcams, online chats, and text messages. Unlike the sexual risk-taking of the hookup culture, this is love so safe that what's most feared is not a sexually transmitted disease, but a computer virus, or perhaps the object of your affection in person. End of quote. The, this was the quote from the New York Times. So um, clearly, and I wouldn't surprise anyone, especially the young people in the audience, clearly technology and the internet has changed quite substantively the terms of the encounter and the management of relationships. Um, in 
one of my earlier books called Intimacies, I have argued that the style, what I call the style of imagination, um, because I think that imagination is just not simply, as Adorno said, a kind of unregulated form of thought, but rather that it is structured. And that structure I call a style. Imagination has a style. So the style of imagination that is deployed in and by internet technologies or internet dating sites must be understood in the context of a technology which obviously disembodies and, textu and textualizes encounters. That is, in those encounters, linguistic exchange becomes the mean to produce um, knowledge about two person and that knowledge has mostly or quite often a psychological form. What you come to know in an internet dating site that's not for sex, by the way, um, um, I just want to make this clear. Usually it is a form of knowledge of another person in which you present yourself and you get to know another person uh, psychologically. So the intimacy that is produced is not experiential or based on the body, but rather on the production of psychological knowledge and modes of relating, and psychological modes of relating to each other. The internet imagination relies on a mass of text-based cognitive knowledge based on the premium it puts on defining subjects as entities endowed with discernible, discrete, and even quantifiable attributes. So you, it's not the Shakespearean or the Hobbesian uh, imagination, but rather what I'm saying is that the internet has a way of shaping the imagination with uh, a lot of cognitive, purely cognitive content, Cogn uh, cognitive and linguistic content. Whereas traditional romantic imagination once was characterized by a mix of um, uh, reality and imagination based on the body, the internet splits imagination, what I imagine about another, it, it splits imagination defined as a, self, as a set of self-generated subjective meanings, it splits the, this from the encounter by having them happen at different points of time. Knowledge of another itself is actually split itself because it is a set of attributes. When you go into a profile, an internet dating profile, you actually are feeling different characteristics and you're looking for different character characteristics and you, you're reacting as well to a picture. So my point here is that internet imagination is opposed to imagination that was based on the body and on intuitive emotions. That is, emotions, emotions, we should, we should view emotions as a kind of very quick reaction, a non-reflexive, a non-cognitive reaction to um, react to the world and to others. That's what emotions are. And the pre-internet imagination, romantic imagination, if you want, was very much based on that on, on, on intuition and on the body. I think the internet imagination completely changes that modality and it is now opposed to what I call retrospective imagining. That is an imagination which tries to capture in absentia the sensi sensory and bodily affects that were provoked by the real body, the real presence of another. And in the retrospective imagination, um, the, that we, we project something that was triggered by, as I said, a very intuitive and incomplete, incomplete knowledge of another person. The internet, on the other hand, offers a prospective form of imagination in which one imagines a specific object whose physical presence has yet to be encountered. Retrospective imagination of the kind I, I just described is information thin, whereas the internet-based prospective imagination is 
information thick. Retrospective romantic imagination was based in, on the body. It synthesized past experience. It was a synthesis that's crucial to my argument. It, was, it synthesized. It mixed and combined the present object with images and experiences located in the past and, um, and, and focused on very few details. You meet someone, you just pay attention to the color of their eyes, their laughter, something, you know, very, very little information. As a result, such imagination consisted of mixing one's past images and interactions with the real person I'm meeting. This is exactly what psychoanalysis says, by the way. For psycho psychoanalysts, when we meet someone, the reason why we are going to react, why a person is going to trigger in us um, a strong reaction is precisely because we are doing this kind of imaginary mix of our past experience with a person and her physical presence and body. So, um, as a mental and emotional process, this specific form of imagination um, needs very little information to be activated. And in fact, I would even say that it is better activated through little rather than a lot of information. And that also suits uh, the dynamic of desire, which needs very little to be activated. To quote psychoanalyst Helen Spector, it may be the way someone lights a cigarette in the wind, tosses her hair back, or talks on the phone, these are the things that we pay attention. Cognitive psychologists call this the signature of a person. These are very small things that mark and characterize a person. In other words, bodily gesture and motions, inflections of the voice do the work of eliciting the romantic fantasy. And for Freud, the capacity to be moved by small and seemingly irrational details results from the fact that in love, we love a lost object. And it is, in, in the Freudian view, um, love is the result of the interaction of parental schemata and cultural familiarity with certain forms of bodily postures and behavior which we now encounter and which are now elicited in our consciousness. So this is what I call the retrospective imagination that's based on experience, that's based on the body, that's based on past experience, and that has also historically produced um, the historical and cultural form that we call longing, uh, long, the experience, longing as a cultural experience. The subject longs for uh, that object. On the other hand, the prospective imagination that is put forward by the internet, as I said, is loaded with verbal information. And it stands in contrast to the information thin um, because it enables and in fact demands knowledge of another that is based on attributes, that is based on a parsing of the person into very distinct attribute. And this in turn, and this I find interesting in my, um, uh, I think it's one of the most interesting finding, it, it is that this process of parsing another person into attribute is probably cognitively and emotionally opposite to the process that is required to idealize another person. Um, internet imagination is perspective. It addresses someone not met yet. It is linguistic, and um, um, it is based on a picture which freezes the person in one single uh, shot or maybe a small, very short uh, video.